Hello and welcome to the third segment of my video class on Gayatri Spivak's landmark essay Can the Subaltern Speak? Can the Subaltern Speak is divided into four sections and today we will be taking a look at the first part of the essay. Gayatri Spivak attempts to problematize the function and responsibility of the post-colonial intellectual and also bring out the limitations of post-structuralist theories. She applies the tool of deconstruction to post-colonial theory and dismantles the tradition of Western thought that has always provided the justification for European colonialism and neocolonialism. The landmark essay Can the Subaltern Speak was first published in the journal Wedge in the year 1985. It was later reprinted in the collection Marxism and the Interpretation of Culture in 1988. The essay was written as a critique of the conversation between the post-structuralist philosophers Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze. This conversation was published in Michel Foucault's book titled Language, Counter Memory, Practice, Selected Essays and Interviews in the year 1977. This work was edited by Donald F. Bouchard. The conversation was published under the title Intellectuals and Power A Conversation Between Michel Foucault and Jill Deleuze. Gayatri Spivak proposes to argue her point by considering a text by two great practitioners of the critique. Intellectuals in Power, a conversation between Michel Foucault and Jill Deleuze. She chose this friendly exchange between two activist philosophers of history. Both of them, Foucault and Deleuze, emphasize the important contributions of French post-structuralist theory. But they do not recognize the need to reduce the heterogeneous networks of power, desire or interest to a logical or consistent narrative. They emphasize the need for a persistent critique. They also believe that it is the intellectual's responsibility to disclose the discourse of society's other or the disenfranchised groups. However, they failed to provide or even consider a suitable ideology and their own inference in intellectual and economic history. Can the subaltern speak. Some of the most radical criticism coming out of the West today is the result of an interested desire to conserve the subject of the West or the West as subject. This is how Gayatri Spivak's landmark essay Can the Subaltern Speak begins. In fact, Spivak begins with a contentious statement that all efforts at critiquing Eurocentrism end up producing quite the opposite result and reinstate or conserve the West as the subject. The post-structuralist intellectuals claim to dismantle the presumptions of colonial studies, but in actuality they end up reinscribing the imperial premises. The flaws in post-structuralist ideology. Though the main purport of the conversation was the dismantling of the Eurocentric premises of colonial studies, the discussion of the conversation between Foucault and Deleuze revealed that the theorists were unconsciously trapped in Eurocentrism that rendered the third world countries transparent. The reference to Maoism and workers' struggle only serves to create an illusion of specificity. 
In fact, French Maoism is not the same as Chinese Maoism, which had as its goal the purging of the remnants of capitalist elements and the ushering in of a socialist revolution. In the same way, the reference to worker struggle was also equally debatable when, when the post-structuralist political theorists assert that every partial revolutionary attack or defense is linked to the workers' struggle, they are actually ignoring the international division of labor that is spread out all throughout the globe. While discussing the workers' struggle, they reveal that they are incapable of dealing with global capitalism because they are themselves trapped in their Eurocentrism. The intellectuals who are supposedly the advocates of heterogeneity and the other unfortunately discuss only the issues that pertain to the West thereby making Asia and Africa invisible or transparent. Spivak says that the intellectuals connect every revolutionary attack to the workers' struggle and that is because of their desire to destroy power. Power means any form of power at any point where it is exercised. Thus, the link to workers' struggle is located in the desire of the intellectuals to just destroy power. But then, they are also incapable of articulating a theory of interest. In the conversation, uh, Foucault and Deleuze, they include a reference to the mechanical relation between desire and interest. We never desire against our interests because interest always finds itself where desire has placed it. So now, so how is the desire to destroy power connected with interest or whose interest does it serve? An ideology is necessary for an understanding of interest. But the intellectuals are consistently indifferent to any form of ideology and thus align themselves with bourgeois socialists. And the bourgeois socialists replace ideology with a para-subjective culture with an unnamed subject which is again nothing but the subject of the West. Foucault in his conversation asserts that the masses know better than the intellectuals and are also capable of saying things well. Only they have to create conditions that will enable the masses or the, the, the subalterns to speak. Deleuze also adds that reality is what happens in factories, schools, prisons and so on. Both of them do not seem to recognize the importance of a counter-hegemonic ideological production and that has helped justify advanced capitalist neocolonialism because the intellectuals with concrete experience to consolidate the international division of labor do not seem aware of their role or their function. They give value to the concrete experience of the oppressed but then they do not consider their own historical roles. The problem with the post-colonial theorists is that they tend to dismiss theory as being just like a box of tools which needs to be put into use if it has to have some value. So the intellectual is forced to think like a manual worker. He has to use theory just like a manual laborer who would use his box of tools. In the conversation between Foucault and Deleuze, Deleuze declares that there is no more representation. 
that is uh, the the subalterns do not need to be represented there is nothing but action action of theory and action of practice which relate to each other as relays and form networks but spivak does not uh, agree to this point she says that the production of theory is also a practice and it would be wrong to assume that abstract pure theory is opposed to concrete applied practice in the conversation delius declares that there is no representation there is nothing but action that is they don't need to represent the subalterns they only need to act and create the conditions where the subalterns can speak for themselves gayatri spivak takes up this point and argues that delius's articulation of the concept of representation is problematic in fact there are two forms of representations one is representation in terms of speaking for the subaltern and second is the representation as in art or philosophy these two senses of representations are related but then they are not the same the intellectuals believe that they cannot represent or speak for the subalterns who are politically aware and conscious now this is a banality according to gayatri spivak so as per the conversation between foco and delius the theorizing intellectual cannot represent those who act and struggle the intellectuals can only act and speak so now the question is whether who whether those who act uh, whether the people who act and struggle are they mute and spivak also talks about uh, the distinctions between a representation within the state and political economy on the one hand and within the theory of the subject on the other spivak refers to a famous passage in the book 18th brumaire of louis bonaparte the two terms that appear in a famous passage from this work are vertutain and dashtelin vertutain stands for political representation as being one among them and dashtelin represents aesthetic representation as an outsider in the case of uh, small peasant proprietors who cannot represent themselves the representative appears in the form of their master who is an authority or power protecting them from other classes under the circumstances there cannot be any feeling of community or a political organization so the representation that is supposedly vertu tang that is as being one among them behaves like a symbolic dashtala class consciousness remains with the feeling of community that belongs to political organizations and not to the feeling associated with the structural model of family what happens in the family is a natural exchange and that is distinct or separate from commercial exchange which marx calls worker so it is this commercial exchange or intercourse that leads to the production of surplus value and therefore it is here the feeling of community leading to class agency must be developed however gayatri spivak considers whether the inclusion whether the exclusion of the family's role is right the family's role in a patriarch in patriarchal social relations is also heterogeneous therefore the inclusion of a monolithic collectivity of women in the list of the oppressed will not resolve the issue she uh, mentions the instance of uh, the french peasants who looked upon napoleon as their savior who would restore their glory 
their class interest was supposedly validated by the proper name historical tradition can offer the name of the, of the father or patronymic however this man also happened to be the very person who carried the napoleonic code which is the first set of laws concerning property family rights and individual rights paradoxically the law of the father also prohibits the search for the natural father and commands that inquiry into paternity is forbidden to illustrate this spivak once again goes back to the passage in the book 18th brumaire which discusses the structural principle of a dispersed and dislocated class subject the consciousness of the small peasant proprietor finds its representative in somebody who appears to work in another's interest the point is about the problematic nature of the concept of representation where the representative or whoever speaks for them has the same interest as the whether the representative or whoever speaks for them has the same interest as as the subalterns the small peasant proprietors who are mentioned in the passage are incapable of representing themselves and this representative takes upon himself the role of a master or an authority protecting them from other classes so in actuality there is no real class consciousness class consciousness exists only in communities that are parts of national links or political organizations gayatri spivak elaborates on marxism and discusses deleuze's views on the thrust of marxism which is that of identifying the problem in terms of power held by the ruling class defined by its interests marx discusses a class the concept of class as a descriptive and transformative one which is more complex than althusser's distinction between class instinct and class position althusser believed that the intellectuals individually may be revolutionaries but as a mass they remain petty bourgeois in ideology class position is the consciousness that conforms with the objective reality and hence rational but class instinct is subjective and spontaneous it is the class instinct that helps the proletarians to arrive at the pro proletarian class position but the intellectuals with their bourgeois class instincts fearfully resist this trans the transition from the bourgeois class instincts to proletarian class positions so for that the bourgeois class instincts have to be revolutionized a uh, marx uh, de defines class as uh, the millions of um, no, marx in fact gives a differential def definition of class as the millions of families whose economic conditions lifestyles and interests are drastically different from those of the other classes leading them on to a harmful confrontation with the other classes but there is no class instinct uh in uh, here uh, unlike the familial existence which can be considered the space of class instinct so class ex instinct exists in familial space but the formation of class the but the formation of a class is artificial and economic and class interest is impersonal because of its heterogeneous nature class consciousness does not indicate a condition where desire and interest coincide as far as speaking for the subalterns is concerned spivak also talks about in the invocation of class consciousness and desire 
as determining interest and also the politics involved in maintaining that the oppressed can speak for themselves. But what actually happens is that the category of the sovereign subject is reinstated even when they claim to denounce it. Not recognizing the heterogeneity is the reason behind the inclusion of the oppressed in the same frame and also the farce of maintaining that they can be made to speak for themselves against an equally monolithic system. So the problem lies in not recognizing the heterogeneity of both the subaltern as well as the power that they are speaking against or the system they are speaking against. So far, Spivak has been focusing mainly on word or tongue or the representation in the political context. But then there is also Darshan Lang which is the philosophical concept of representation. Dastat Lang is also representation in the economic context. That is a commodity has two kinds of value, the exchange value and the use value. According to Marx, value is calculated as the representation of labor, which again is treated more like a commodity. Uh, that is the labor of the worker is dashtalang in the value of the product. In other words, the value of the product is a representation of abstract labor. So that brings us to the theory of capitalist exploitation. Capitalist exploitation is a type of domination essentially in terms of interests. The ruling class is always conscious of its interests and the thrust of Marxism was to determine the problem of exploitation in terms of interests. Gayatri Spivak elaborates on this aspect to establish the point that uh, theorists like Deleuze and Guattari build their case on the basis of the Marxist ideology of capitalist exploitation. She says that it is not possible to explain the micrological texture of power from a Marxist viewpoint. This is because the relationship between global capitalism and nation state alliance is macrological. So to do that, one must resort to theories that do not overlook the category of representation in its two senses. That is, they must note the representation of the oppressed in writing or dashtalang as separate from those paternal proxies or agents of power who represent and speak for them the water tongue. Spivak does not believe in totalizing or generalizing the concepts of power and desire. According to her, the intellectuals launch a new theory of interpretation where they argue that there is no representation or signifier. In the conversation between Foucault and Deleuze, the problem presented is that there is no representation. Theory becomes a relay of practice and the oppressed can know and speak for themselves. Intellectuals become transparent as they merely report on the non-represented subject and pretend to analyze the workings of power and desire. Edward Said critiques Foucault's concept of power as a mystifying one. It obliterates the role of classes and also the role of economics. Now this critique is important and Spivak adds to Said's analysis the notion of power and desire as characterized by the transparency of the intellectual. Edward Said emphasized the importance of the intellectual whereas Foucault's concept 
challenges the role of both hegemonic and oppositional intellectuals. This, according to Spivak, is similar to craftiness where the critic or the intellectual evades his institutional responsibility. The French intellectuals are incapable of understanding the concepts of power and desire of the other of Europe. They cannot imagine the kind of power and desire that characterize the unnamed subject of the other of Europe. Thus, they also become uh, responsible uh, for, um, uh, they also become responsible for the constitution of the other as a mere shadow of the Eurocentric uh, self. Uh, that is, the process of othering is in actuality the construction of an other as inferior to the Eurocentric self. Othering is a tool to legitimize colonial oppression and, or, and also colonially shaped inequalities. The othering was actually done in the interest of a dynamic economic situation, a situation that requires that interests desires, motives and power should be dislocated in order to secure a new balance of hegemonic relations. She concludes the first uh, part of the essay with the statement that the intellectual should see the economic factor as it reinscribes the social text. So that was the end of the first part of Gayatri Spivak's essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? I'll be back very soon with an explanation and analysis of the second part. Thank you.